to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 2 Peter. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast. We hope that you'll have your Bible ready as we're going to look to the Word of God as our final authority in everything we say and do. Again, we welcome you to our study. We want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. You'd be an honored guest at any of their gatherings. And if you've got a Bible question about salvation or the church, you'd like to sit down and study the Word of God, they'd be more than happy to study the Scriptures with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ... We'd love to help you in your study of God's Word. All of our lessons that we have online are available free of charge. We have a host of lessons on various topics, uh, every book of the Bible, a lot of different special studies. If you'd like to have a copy of those, just check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have it in a hard copy of a DVD or CD, we make that available as well, free of charge. And you can order that through our website as well, or by writing or calling us at the information given at the end of the broadcast. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, our main concern is we want men and women to go to heaven. We want people to know God's will and to spend eternity with our Father. And so we encourage you today to have your Bible ready and let's look to God's Word as we think about this timely subject on false teachers. Second Peter Chapter 2 and 3 is all about realizing, being reminded that false teachers do exist, have existed among God's people, and do still exist today, and we've got to be on the lookout for them. Look in 2 Peter chapter 2, and I want you to notice what Peter says about this in verse number 1. Peter says... But there were also false prophets among the people, listen now, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bringing on themselves swift destruction." Among God's people under the Old Testament, there were false teachers. You could think of people who said things, Balaam, Balak, people like that who were not what they should have been, who were teaching things that were not right. And just as there were false teachers among them then, Peter says, I want you to be aware, there are false teachers out there still today. Friend, this is why. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. This is why as Christians, we need to be on the lookout for wolves in sheep's clothing. Those who are secretly coming in, who are trying to teach things that are not right, trying to carry people away with them for money, for clout, for pride, whatever it may be. And we need to realize that's going to cost people their souls. And so Peter is going to discuss... In 2 Peter chapter 2, the, the punishment of these teachers is going to be very severe. Severe. In fact, 2 Peter 2 and Jude are parallel in their message about these false teachers and their immoral way of life. They're like the angels, verse 4, who did not respect God's authority. They're like the unrighteous world in the days of Noah who were just living it up with any, without any regard for God. They're like the people in Sodom and Gomorrah who didn't put their trust and hope in Almighty God. And friend, these people are causing great harm on the church. Well, let's think about that in the modern sense today. Before we believe, this is our encouragement today. Before we believe anything, 
When you hear somebody say something, when somebody stands up and claims to speak on behalf of God, when somebody tells you, you've got to do this to be right with God, what's the first thing you ought to do? Just up and accept it and say, well, that must be true. He looks religious and said it was from God, so it's got to be right. No. The encouragement we offer to determine whether one is telling the truth or a lie is to check it by the standard. Let me give you the perfect illustration. We need to each put into practice what Acts 17, 11 teaches. The Bible says this, Of the Bereans, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness, now watch this, and searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I want you to envision that scene. The Apostle Paul comes to the house in Berea. He knocks on the door. He says, I've got a message from Jesus. Well, they do. Slam the door in his face? No. They received it with all readiness. What's that mean? They said, Paul, come in. Paul came in. They sat down at the table. Paul gave him his spiel about Jesus from the old prophets and, and how Jesus is the Messiah. They listened carefully. They took notes. Well, at the end of Paul's message, did they accept it hook, line, and sinker? No, here's what they said next. They said, Paul, we appreciate you coming by today. We've heard what you had to say. We've taken notes. Now we're going to check it. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Friend, that is such a powerful and important principle for people today. There are false teachers out there. There are people teaching false ways of salvation for their own pride and for their own gain and for what they can get out of it. And before I accept and do anything, I want to make sure it's in my Bible and that's what God tells me to do. And friend, God knows how to take care of His own. God knows how to deliver the ungodly and God's going to punish those who do wrong. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Look in verses 9 and 10. After hearing about those who are tormented, being around false teachers, the Bible says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. These are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. God, He knows how to take care of His own people and He knows how to deliver us out of ungodliness. You see, one day God's going to bring His judgment on those who've done wrong. 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 10 says, God is coming in a flaming fire to take vengeance on those who do not know God, on do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of His power. One day, God's going to right every wrong and He's going to bring judgment on these people. What about the faithful? God will take care of them as well. There's a day coming when Christ will come to gather His own. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And friend, let's remember... God is always, He's always going to lead us in the right way and deliver us out of ungodliness. Just as He did His people in the Old Testament, so He will do today. But here's the main problem. Many of these false teachers that are oppressing people today, just as they did in the first century, they've got no regard for God's authority the only voice they want to hear is their own. Did you hear First, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 10 and 11? Listen to it again. Especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They're presumptuous, self-willed, not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. The only voice they care to hear is their own. They've got no concern for God and His authority. Friend, those are the kind of people we want to make sure that we don't associate with and we don't let them ruin our good Christian character. And friend, this is why it's all so important. I hope you'll listen real carefully to this. We want to beware of false teachers and we want to make sure they don't get into God's family, into God's church, because a Christian can be taught error, fall away, and be lost. Second Peter chapter 2. 
verses 20 through 22 is one of the most graphic pictures of a Christian going back into error and being in a lost state. You know, there's the old idea that once you're saved, you're always saved and you can never be lost. You can't fall from grace and the perseverance of the saints. All those ideas have been heard and taught by false teachers. My friend, they're just not true. I want you to hear what Peter said about Christians falling away. And you see if once saved, always saved is true. Look in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Remember, he's talking to Christians who have known the truth. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, stop right there. Let's realize, let's realize these people are Christians. They have escaped the pollutions of the world by obeying the gospel of Jesus. We're not talking about an alien sinner. We're, talking about, we're not talking about somebody who's living sinful. These are people who've come out of the world by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so have that clear in your mind. Notice again 2 Peter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But, it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Friend, how could it be worse for these people if they were not saved before? They knew the truth. They obeyed the truth. They knew the way of righteousness. They got caught up again in error and sin, entangled in it, and overcome. And listen to this now. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. What do you mean? It would be better had they not known the way of righteousness. How could that be? Because now they know it. They know what it means to be saved. And for the rest of eternity, they'll know what they had and what they gave up. You see, a Christian... He's seen how good it is to be a child of God. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. How It's so good, and we know it's so good to be a Christian. And yet, to go back, a Christian's got a serious conscience. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4 speaks of certain people who were taught demonic doctrines and they had their conscience seared with a hot iron. They're past the point of feeling, as it were. And a Christian knows full well what he's doing and what it will cost him. Friend, it's very important that we understand false teachers are deadly. False teachers are eternally damning because of what they teach and what it costs people in the end. Why is it such a big deal to be taught error? Because a Christian can get caught back up in error, return into a state of sin, and be lost eternally. God doesn't want that. We don't want that. But let's realize it is a reality. And friend, it's also very important for every Christian to be reminded of the old truths of Christian living and godliness. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to notice what Peter says about reminder here. 2 Peter 3 verse 1, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing that scoffers will come in the last time. We need to be reminded of those truths that we find in God's Word and in the Bible. And we don't need to listen to people who are scoffing and laughing and making fun of the Bible. For in God's Word, it's what's going to stand the test of time. You see, the Bible, it stood the test of time since the very beginning. God's Word has. All Scripture is inspired of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 It's the Word of God that saves man. James chapter 1, verses 19-22 through 22. It's that Word, the Gospel, that is God's power to save and it's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword as it pierces even the joining of spirit and soul in man. Hebrews 4, verse number 12. But in context, 
There are not just scoffers here, but there are certain scoffers they're making fun of and they're making light of a specific event. And that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. How much error has been taught and how many times have we heard people try to make the claim they know when the Lord's coming or the Lord's already come or something like that. Well, friend, don't buy into that because those type of people, they've been around for a long time. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 4. Of these scoffers, it is said, they are saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. You know, there were people then who were making fun of the second coming. Lord's not coming back. Where is He at? He hadn't come yet. Nothing's changed. And you've been talking about this second coming and everything. The sun's coming up. The sun's going down and nothing's changing. So everybody, they're trying to convince people this isn't going to happen. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to live in view of that. And Peter goes on to prove that claim's not true in verses 5 through 7. He says, you know, you're wrong about that because there have been major changes since creation. Since the moment creation took place, there have been some major, major changes. You talk about the flood in verse 6 as a major change. That same word that set the world into motion, that same word that set the flood into motion, it's the same word that teaches us about the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he says, don't believe it because things have changed since the beginning. But he says there's something else that you're not getting as well. Not only are these scoffers mistaken about proof, the proof that there isn't any, they also have a misunderstanding of God's time schedule. And friend, that's where so many people go wrong. People think that God is on our time schedule and God's watching His clock and it's not the way it works for God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and notice what we're saying. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. But beloved... Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Time was created for man. God is not bound or regulated by our time. In heaven, in eternity, time's not something that has always existed. Again, that's so hard for us to imagine because we're so bound by that. But here's the point he's trying to say. Don't try to predict the Lord's coming based off your time schedule. Don't say, well, it's been six hours. The Lord hadn't come yet. It's been a thousand years. The Lord hadn't come yet. He's not coming. No, no, no. The Bible says that's not the way it works. Here's what the Bible does say. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36. No man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man's coming except the Father Himself. Here, here's what I can know for sure. Anytime somebody says, I've got it figured out, the Lord's coming on this day, or the Lord's not coming, you know what I know about that person? I know they're a liar. We don't mean that to be unkind. But Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour when the Lord is coming. Well, why does it seem like that it's taken so long sometimes then? I want you to consider this with me. One of the reasons that God has not come, at least Peter tells us, is because God is long-suffering. The long-suffering of God is still available for man. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to notice in verse number 9. The Lord is not slow concerning His promises, as some count slowness, but is long-suffering toward us. Listen to this now not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. Why does it seem like it's taken so long? Because God wants all men to repent. The moment Christ comes back, there'll be no more time for repentance. Thus, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell and He's giving men and women every chance available to appear and get ready or ample time to get ready for when He does appear. And so instead of scoffing at it, laughing at it and saying, ah, you said the Lord's coming, where's He at? We ought to be thankful that God's given man time to get ready and to do what He wants to live with Him forever. Now, what then do we know about the nature of the second coming. Here's some things we know. When the Lord does come, 
it'll be like a thief. He's not going to call you and say, get ready, I'm coming over. It's like a thief. It'll be sudden. It'll be un, it will be unprepared for it. It'll be unready for it in some ways. Look in verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Listen to all these things that are going to take place. It's like a thief. A thief doesn't call you up at 10 till 2 and says, get ready, I'm coming over. It's unprepared. People are not ready. It's something that catches you off guard almost. What's going to happen? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. On that day, every ear will hear, every eye will see the coming of the Lord. The elements, that is the, the earth and the works in them will melt with a fervent heat. Can you imagine the heat of that? The heavens, verse 12 says, the heavens will be dissolved being on fire. And so combined with the second coming of, Lord, of the Lord, there's the destruction of all things, the finality of all things. We also know from various passages that the righteous will meet Him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, when He comes, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We know that at this time, all who are in the grave will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And friend, we also know based on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 57, and Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, that our bodies are going to be changed. We're not going to be corruptible. We're, we're not going to face decay and all the problems that we face now. We'll be given that new body, which will be like the Lord's. But here's the whole point of it. You say, okay, that's all good and well. That's a lot of information about the second coming. And I know Peter tells us that we shouldn't be upset that he hasn't come yet. What does all that really matter for me, though? Here's what it means. The point of this all is this. Since Christ is still coming, this is the whole message Peter's been trying to drive home. Live a holy and godly life in view of that. Look at verse 11 again. 2 Peter 3, look in verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness. Friend, I don't know when the Lord's coming. You don't either. No one does. Anybody who does is a liar. Nobody knows that. But here's what I do know. I know He is coming. And I know I need to be ready when He comes. And the way that I remain ready is by living a good, holy life before Him. I want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22. I want to have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 5. I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 35. And we want to do everything we can to promote the cause of Christ and live in such a way that we can resist the devil and temptation. And friend, that's something to look forward to. Verse number 12, we know, when all things are dissolved, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and that's what Christians are looking for. That beautiful place described in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, where God will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more sorrow, death, pain, crying, all the former things have passed away, that that city whose builder and maker is God, that heavenly city, that's what Christians are looking for each and every day. And friend, we ought to look forward to the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You say, okay, that's all good and well. But here's the point of it. 2 Peter 3.18 Since these things are true, here's what Peter says. Grow. And that's not just a one-time point in action idea. The word grow there is durative in the original language means that's a continual ongoing action. Since Christ is still coming, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Don't get stagnant. 
Don't get in a rut. Don't let these false teachers drag you down, but you be drinking deeply of God's Word and God's way and growing spiritually so that when He comes, you're ready to go home with Him. 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes, we want to desire the pure milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. Matthew 5 verse 6, we're to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so our prayer today is that you have uh, thought about the reminders that we see in First and Second Peter that every one of us has been encouraged to keep walking in the light and doing what God wants to and that we'll be ready when the Lord comes. Friend, are you ready if the Lord were to come any day now? We know He could come at any time. We don't know when it's going to be, but it could be any time. Are you ready if the Lord were to come? Are you a child of God? If the final curtain fell, that trumpet, that great shout, the noise of the heavens melting, if all that occurred, would you be ready? If you're not a Christian, we're begging you today. Won't you become a child of God? Do you believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world? Do you believe He's the Son of God? He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin and turn to God. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having turned from sin, would you acknowledge the Savior with your mouth? Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, would you, to have every evil thought, every evil deed removed, to be new and spotless and clean in God's sight. Would you be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Would you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? Ananias told Saul of Tarsus this, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And if you are a Christian, friend, our encouragement today to you is this, keep walking in the light. Keep walking in newness of life. Keep being faithful unto death. Don't ever, ever give up. Be reminded of how good it is to be a Christian and never let anything get in the way of your Christian walk. We encourage you to join us next time as we'll study more about the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the